How on earth can we cope with everyday life? Do you ever, do you ever ask that? Yeah? I, do you ever just think, do you know what I can't do today? I just can't do it. Um, and people say, you got it! You got it! And you're like, I don't got it. <laughs> I don't got it. Like, how am I supposed to make sense of today and all the demands on my time? How can I get through another day with the kids? How can I get through another day with the baby, with my boss, with financial insecurity and uncertainty? How can I get through the weeks when it seems everyone is against me, there's deadlines looming, I'm ill, tired, frustrated, depressed? How do I make sense of life? And how do I get help for each day as it comes? Lots of people these days are turning to all sorts of different types of spirituality to answer that question. People are pursuing all sorts of Eastern methods and meditation and visualization. Essentially trying to think their way out of their troubles. Hoping that if they can acquire some higher view of reality, some greater knowledge, that that will help me cope and understand everything that's going on around me. But is it enough? Does it work? A lot of people, including a lot of Christians, think that that's essentially what Christianity is. A form of spirituality that hopes on a better future. And so many Christians simply try and get through the day by fixing their eyes on the future. And we might be saying things like, you know, one day, God will take me to heaven. One day, and then all these problems will be gone. I'm just going to fix my mind on that. If I can just keep that view, I can get through today. If I can just get rid of this body and all this stuff, all this work, all this flesh, that's what's really holding me back. I can't wait to be free of it all and just to be spiritually with Jesus in heaven. And lots of Christians think that way. Maybe you sometimes think that way. And faith becomes this kind of mental exercise. It all happens up here, you know, with our eyes closed. I never know really why we close our eyes when we pray. But Paul has a different answer for us. He wants us to know that the only way to get through life is to put Jesus at the centre. That sounds good, doesn't it? We could leave the sermon there. But how? How do we put Jesus at the centre of our lives? Well, Paul wrote this book, this letter, to the church in Colossae. And he was writing it to address a particular issue, a particularly dangerous and persuasive issue and pervasive idea that was threatening to take hold of the Colossian church. And it was a heresy called Gnosticism. Gnosticism. Some of you are like, oh, I think I've heard of that. Others you are like, what are you on about? Um, Gnosticism is a complex, ancient heresy that is actually still around today. And the reason it's still around is because it's very, very subtle, or it can be very subtle. It doesn't make a big display of overthrowing the gospel, but rather it invades the gospel and distorts it. Gnosticism is an insidious problem that plagues the church, particularly the modern, rational, evangelical church. Because Gnosticism is all about knowledge. It's all about knowledge. And so it sounds very spiritual. But central to Gnosticism is the denial of the goodness of matter, of physical things. Particularly the denial that God uses physical things to bring spiritual life. Okay, that's the big thing. The denial that God uses physical things to bring spiritual life. So when you hear Christians say things about baptism, for example, like... Oh, the water doesn't really matter. What it's really about is, yeah? Or 
the water, there's nothing happening in the water, it's just a sign, it's just a symbol. Or if you hear someone say of communion, oh, the bread and the cup aren't important, we could use a biscuit and juice, or we could just use our, our minds, or this doesn't matter, what really matters is, yeah, that is the effect of Gnosticism. This lie that physical matter can't be used by God to impart spiritual life. You see, that's a real big problem because that's exactly what Jesus did in the incarnation. He took on a human body to bring us spiritual life. You see, when the church begins to believe the lie of Gnosticism, denying the goodness of physical matter, then it does lead to a denial of the reality of the incarnation of God and his bodily resurrection. And so this heresy that was taking hold of the Colossian church simply was four key points. They were saying that angels were greater than Christ because obviously spirit is better than body, is what they were saying. That Jesus was not unique but one amongst many mediators. Thirdly, they were saying that sin is the result of a lack of knowledge. And so, fourthly, they were saying salvation was simply about regaining that knowledge that was lost in Eden. So these are the four key things that were being taught, threatening to be taught in the Colossian church. And so, so for the Gnostic, salvation is simply about being told something about gaining knowledge so that we can escape to this higher spiritual level of existence. In other words, for them, being a Christian is just about your mind, about thinking things, knowing things, and believing things. But that's not the gospel, is it? Jesus came. He joined us to show us how to be truly human. Not by rejecting physical matter, but by embracing it. Taking on human flesh, and guess what? Keeping it. There is a human body in heaven, in the presence of God. And it's safe there, it, because that's where it actually belongs. For the Gnostic, salvation is only some future reality that happens in some spiritual realm. But for Christians, people who are following Jesus, the man, actually salvation begins today. Salvation happens today in our physical bodies. We experience salvation. We live it and walk in it today. And yes, it culminates in a future of full, physical, resurrection life, not in heaven, but here on the earth. Heaven will come down to earth. So we can say I'm looking forward to heaven as a shorthand. But as long as we're really clear that that heaven is here on earth. And so what Paul does to combat this lie, to fight against this lie, is simply tell the truth. He simply preaches point for point the ancient truth of Jesus. Emphasising those aspects that Gnosticism disputed. And so Paul begins, as he often does in his letters, telling the church that he regularly prays for them. Verse 3. Why? Why does Paul regularly pray for them? Verse 4. Because of their faithfulness. He says, we pray for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints. What does Paul mean when he says, we've heard of your faith? How can you hear of someone's faith? Uh, you know this, you know the answer to this question, because have you ever been told about a faithful brother or sister in Christ? Maybe a, a missionary or an aunt or an uncle or my pastor who was like this. If you were ever told about a faithful Christian, what were you told? Were you told, oh, they really believe stuff? Or were you told what they did? How they lived? How they prayed? How they gave? Paul doesn't mean, oh, we've heard that you just really believe that Jesus is the Messiah. No, he means that he has heard how they live out their faith. Epaphras has come and told them. 
seen, for example, in the love that they have for all the saints. And again, Paul is not saying, we have heard about the warm feelings that you have in your heart for your fellow Christians. No. How would Paul know about their love for each other? Because it's seen in their actions towards one another, as they care for each other. So Paul, right from the beginning, is saying, we thank God that you are living out, acting out the faith that we preach to you, holding fast to Jesus, being faithful to him, and loving each other. Verse 5, because of the hope laid up in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel. Ah, there you go, Doug, see? It's in heaven. It's the hope in heaven. Paul says the reason they live that way is because they're fixed on heaven. It is about the future. But what? What is it that is laid up in heaven for the church? It's not some generic way. It's not some way of life. It's Jesus. Jesus is the treasure that is laid up in heaven. The hope laid up for you is Jesus, the human body of Christ. He is your hope. The gospel, the good news, is that God became flesh. That God showed the value and dignity of human flesh. And he shows us that that flesh belongs in the presence of God the Father. And so, Paul says, so you value bodies. You value the suffering bodies of the saints around you and you serve them. And you realize that Jesus lived out his human life in a human body, his life in a human body. And so you seek to live that same life today in your human body. Because, well, if he did it, then he can enable me to do it. Following his way, working out your own salvation. Verse 6. The gospel which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world, is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. He says, from the very first day you heard it, the gospel has produced fruit in you. That's what it does. The gospel isn't received um, when it is merely believed and mentally believed the gospel requires more than intellectual agreements the gospel receiving the gospel is meeting with the living God and being changed by him so that you are fruitful they heard the gospel of Jesus and they came to know Jesus and that's what's bringing forth fruits they didn't come to know a bunch of things about Jesus they came to know him in fact, they, were, they have been put in him in their baptism. Now, I'm saying that, that all I've said, that Paul is writing against this backdrop of this heresy that is infiltrating the church. This heresy that reduces faith down to mere knowledge and kind of mental assent. Now, in saying that, of course, knowledge isn't bad, is it? In fact... Paul speaks of knowledge five times here in Colossians and each time he does we need to take note of what he's saying about it because he's writing against these guys who say it's all about knowledge. Paul's like, yeah, you, you kind of need to know some stuff but for what purpose, yeah? And so here the first one is in verse 9. And so he says, so from the day we heard we have not ceased to pray for you asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. This is wonderful. Paul is essentially praying for them to mature into, as Christians, to mature as Christians. So he gives thanks, they've heard the gospel, and he gives thanks, and it's evident in the way that they live, as they serve one another and they're becoming more and more fruitful. But Paul doesn't say, great, job done, I can leave off. The idea of, I got saved, past tense, job done, is completely alien to Paul. For Paul, salvation is always being saved. 
It is the way we live, the way we walk, the way we grow in. And so Paul doesn't stop praying for them now that they are saved. If anything, he prays for them all the more. He says, you're all on this road, and I'm praying that you continue on this road. As you have already come to know Christ, that you would continue now to be filled with him. So that you would come to maturity in the Christian life. This is really important for us to remember. We, we haven't made it. We're not the finished article today. And I think the longer you're a Christian, the more you understand that. If you've just recently become a Christian, or have only been a Christian for a couple of years, it can be very tempting to think, yes, I've made it, I've done it, I've left my old life behind, and I've crossed into the life of the church. And with you we say, Amazing, hallelujah, praise Jesus. But we say that you're not done yet. You, you're joining us now on this journey. The exciting thing is, it's not done, it's beginning. It's beginning. Your new life with Jesus has just begun. You've had the first day of eternity. And so we take each day with Jesus, learning being teachable, increasing in the knowledge of God. Verse 10. Increasing in the knowledge of God. Do we really understand what that implies for us? If we are increasing in knowledge of God, it means we don't know it all yet. It means that being a Christian is marked by learning. And if we need to learn, then it means we didn't know something before. And this is really important, right? I want to say this. As Christians, we love to find out we're wrong. That's what it should be. As Christians, we should love to find out we're wrong. Now, I did not always think this way. I used to think, I know. I used to think I was meant to have all the answers. So if my non-Christians ask me a question, I should have the answer. Let me give you the right answer. It's even worse as a pastor. Surely I'm meant to have all the answers. And so the temptation is to act so sure about things. Because you're scared of being found out that you don't know the answers. But I've learned in recent years that there's great, great freedom in saying, I don't know. I'm probably wrong. I I'm not 100% about that. I, I was definitely wrong about that before. If I know it all, if I'm dead set that I'm right, then there is no room for me to grow in the knowledge of God. But if I'm willing to admit that I could be wrong about something, well, then Jesus can teach me something. And I love being taught stuff by Jesus. I've been a Christian for at least 33 years, 37, depending how you want to count it. Less if you count just from my baptism. But just about every year, uh, sorry, just about every day, I realise that I've been wrong about something. Rachel's not surprised to hear that. She lives with me. <laughs> or at the very least, I haven't fully understood something about God. Every day, every day is a day to find out you were wrong and increase in your knowledge of God. If that's not your experience then you might not be walking with Jesus. And I say that as for somebody who for many years wasn't really. Had all my theological ducks in a row, thought I knew it all and what it meant, but I just wasn't reading my Bible properly. Because I was always going to my Bible to confirm what I already thought, rather than to learn where I was wrong and increase in the knowledge of God. I found that finding out that you were wrong about something to do with Jesus or his word or his world is the most exhilarating and joyful experience a Christian can have. Because it means, if you've done that, it means you've learned something from Jesus. But what is the point of all this maturing? What is the point of reading my Bible every day and studying the word and being filled with the knowledge of God? Verse 10, it's so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, pleasing him, 
bearing fruit in every good work. This knowledge isn't so you can sit down and go, wow, I know stuff and I can correct people. No, it's so you can be a good Christian, so you can be a good person, so you can learn how to walk in the way of Jesus, follow his way of salvation, be of use to your neighbour and proclaim the gospel to people. All of this knowledge is not to escape to some greater spiritual worlds, but to be of greater spiritual service in this one. To learn from Jesus how to be human and then to be it in our bodies, in our flesh, not just our minds. Actively subduing our pride and our passions, loving and serving others, doing good works to build God's kingdom on earth. So that brings us to the the real crux of the issue. How do we get this knowledge? How do we learn how to be human? How can we be strengthened with power, as verse 11 puts it? Is it some Gnostic answer? Is it thinking and meditation? No. It's drawing close to Jesus by having Jesus at the centre of our lives. Verse 13. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. Now, as we read that word redemption, we might immediately think of a transaction, you know, redeeming a token, redeeming a voucher, a legal exchange. But Paul wants us to think much more deeply. He wants us to think about being redeemed from slavery, from one kingdom into another. And of course, the great model for this is the Exodus. God redeemed his people when he freed them out of Egypt and into God's kingdom in the promised land. The Exodus is actually so, it's not just a great story in the Bible, though it is a great story in the Bible. God put it there to, as we said, from Genesis to Revelation, Exodus is in there. It's all about Jesus. God is telling us how he, his model for salvation. And what happens? What happens between the Exodus being delivered out of the kingdom of darkness and coming to the promised land, being transferred into the kingdom of Jesus. Well, what happens in between there? 40 years of wilderness wandering. And who was with them? We read it, didn't we, in Nehemiah? Jesus. Jesus was with them. We read in Nehemiah that great summary, really from creation, to to the exodus of all that the Lord God has done for the church, particularly in the wilderness. And it was Jesus himself, we know this from Jude and other places, it was Jesus himself who was in the cloud by day and in the fire by night, always with them, actually there with them, giving them commandments, giving them his spirit, feeding them the holy bread of heaven. This is what Paul is talking about here. This is the model for everything he's talking about. How do we arrive in the kingdom of the beloved son? How do we survive wandering through the wilderness of life? How can we face each hard trudged day with hope and purpose? Only with Jesus at the center. Only by following him and being fed by him. Because... How many people made it into the kingdom? After the exodus, how many people actually made it into the promised land? Two. Now, I'm not saying that only those two people were saved by Jesus. But in this model of salvation, only two. So for St. Paul, he is writing to a load of Christians who have been brought out of the kingdom of darkness. But in his mind, he now he really needs to pray for them. He needs to continue praying for them, keep encouraging them to walk with Jesus. Because for Paul, there is no guarantee that just because you were one of those people who were brought out of slavery, that you will make it to the promised land. It's, that, it's, the, it's the parable of the soils that we prayed at the beginning of the service, isn't it? Because faced with the wilderness... Some of them turned back. We read that in Nehemiah, didn't we? They went back to Egypt. They wanted the melons and the cucumbers of Egypt, even if it meant slavery. Others 
remained in the wilderness, but their hearts turned back to Egypt in their behavior and their worship. In both cases, why didn't they make it? Because Jesus wasn't the center of their lives. But Doug, Doug, I really, really want to make it. Good, good. Then keep Jesus at the center. It's not a hard thing to do. Keep him at the center. If you keep Jesus at the center of your life, if you walk with him day by day, if you follow him, learn from him, feast on him, he will bring you through. But if you are still in love with the world, if anything else, anything is at the center of your life, you will not make it. What got the Israelites through the wilderness, well, certainly what got Joshua and Caleb through the wilderness, was not the hope of the promised land. It was the reality of Jesus in their midst day by day. It wasn't a mental exercise of imagining and visualizing the promised land, but simply opening their eyes and seeing him there. Seeing Jesus at the center of the camp, touching the bread that he gave, feeling the heat of the pillar of fire, hearing him speak from Mount Sinai. In the same way, just closing your eyes and hoping for heaven will not be enough to get you through the challenges of each day. You need to open your eyes and see that Jesus is with you today. And this is where Paul really drives it home. How can I open my eyes and see Jesus with me today? How can I get this redemption? How does it actually get to me? I'm here in North Halifax in 2022. How does his redemption get to me? Is it purely a mental exercise? Is it just knowledge? No. We have redemption through blood. Physical, messy blood. Verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Now, if you just followed along with me on that, you'll notice the ESV does not have through his blood in there. Other translations have it. And it is disputed whether it does actually go here in Colossians or not. I don't care about that. Okay? What is not disputed is that it is true. Because this exact phrase is in Ephesians. Okay? Paul says it in Ephesians 1.7. Exactly the same thing. Okay? If you want to argue with me, you can argue with me. I don't care. We have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins. Now, just again, as with the word redemption, we can have some theological clutter around this idea of blood. Partly because we're squeamish and we don't like the idea of blood. And so we often treat it as simply a shorthand for Jesus' death. So we read blood, we don't like that, we think death, and we jump to we jump then to punishment for sins, and we immediately again think in modern Western transactional terms. But again, Paul is not thinking like a modern Westerner, he's thinking like a Hebrew. He's thinking far more biblically than we do naturally. Paul, when Paul speaks of blood, he's leaning on the scriptures for his understanding. And what did they do with blood in the Old Testament? You'll remember from our series in Leviticus. They used blood to purify and cleanse things. Utensils, temple fixtures, sometimes even people. Blood was used to purify and wipe away sin. Actual blood. And what we see is very interesting. We didn't really mention this much in Leviticus. But what we see is that in the rituals of the Old Testament that involved blood being applied, the killing wasn't ritualized. Okay, so what happens is you read these instructions and there's all sorts of details about how to butcher the animal, which bits go to who, which bits you sacrifice, which bits you eat, which bits go on the fire. 
There's all of this detail, but you notice it never tells you how to kill the animal. Have you noticed that? It says you take the blood. It tells you all the details of the parts, but it just says you kill it. The death is not part of the ritual. The blood is. It's the blood that does it. Not the death of the animal. And some of you are thinking, okay, Doug, but you can't get the blood without the death. I know. Let's put part of that aside for a minute. Let's just hear what the Bible's saying. It's the blood that does it. And Paul is applying this same truth to the blood of Christ. Jesus' blood, his actual blood, is what washes away our sin. Not the thought of his blood, not the remembrance of his blood, but his actual blood applied to us. Paul is not using blood as a shorthand for Jesus' death. He could have used the word death, and he does in other places in the New Testament. But if you, whenever you read in the New Testament, whenever the New Testament speaks of redemption, or forgiveness of sins, or washing us clean, or transferring us into his kingdom, or receiving his life, it never speaks of Jesus' death. It always is through his blood. It's his blood. Why? Because sin is what made us, power, made us slaves to the power of darkness. Sin is what holds us in chains and keeps us the devils. And blood is what wipes away that sin. Blood is what wipes away the chains of death and sets us free, forgiving us. It is his blood that redeems us. Sometimes I don't think we really think clearly about what the tabernacle and the temple would have really been like. Usually we see drawings and there's a lovely priest in his very, very white robes. And he stood in front of like a barbecue pit. Yeah? And there's like a lovely lamb you know, on his side, just like very neatly um, dead, being roasted. That is not what it would have been like at all. We know now that there were these gutters that came out of the temple in Jerusalem and they were constantly flowing with blood and offal and organs. There were so many sacrifices that this blood, constantly there was a trough at the bottom of the altar and it led these gutters out of the temple and it ran down the sides. This 24-7 stream of blood flowing out of the temple. And inside the temple there was blood everywhere. It, they, they splattered it everywhere, not because they were careless, they did it on purpose. We don't realise the mess the tabernacle would have looked like. And you would have walked in and go, wow, that is a lot of blood. That is what I need. And, and they, would, they would take something and they would smear blood on it and go, there you go, it's clean now. <laughs> and like to us, that's just a completely foreign idea, isn't it? If you have blood on something, it's unclean to us. But not to the Jew, not to the Old Testament church. Blood cleans things. And so this language is used. Paul is saying, you Gnostics, you think that salvation is about divine knowledge. You think it's all about escaping the body. Paul says, let me tell you. The only way to be saved, the only way to be redeemed, is through the blood, the messy, material blood of the incarnated Son of God. That's how Jesus sets us free. His blood put on you. We began with the question, how can I get through the day? How can I make it through the wilderness of this life? By having good routines? No. By doggedly just setting our eyes on heaven and hoping it's enough? No. By closing our eyes and blocking out the reality of the world around us? No. The only way we can do each day is with Jesus at the centre. And how do we live a Jesus-centred life? It's actually very easy. It's church. It's church. Church is the place that Jesus is at work on all the, in all the earth. Church is where we receive the sacraments, these physical things, these words that you are hearing now are physical. They are coming from my body into your body. And I'll spare you that whole thing that I do 
you, you've heard it enough by now, but they are physical things. They are physical things of bread and cup and water that God uses to give you spiritual life. How incredible is that? We don't live in a boring, flat, materialistic world. We live in the world of the seen and the unseen. And it come, the unseen comes to us in the seen. Each week we receive the blood of Jesus that redeemed us and washes us clean, forgiving us our sins. Jesus is very literally at the center of our worship every Sunday. And then through the week, basically all we're doing through the week is we live from one divine worship service to another. We're living from communion to communion. This doesn't come and interrupt our life. This is life and everything else just happens in the cracks between communions. That's, that's how you want, you want to view your life. Through the week, bet between divine worship services, living from one communion to the next, we just simply we read our Bible every day to increase in the knowledge of God. We pray every day. We repent every day. We do everything we can to be together, to pray together on Tuesdays. We do everything we can to read the Bible together on Thursdays. These things are what place Jesus at the center of our lives. We don't have Jesus centered lives. We don't have Jesus centered lives just because we say we do. We don't have Jesus centered lives just because we wish we did. We have Jesus centered lives by actually making him the center of everything we do, every decision we make, every word we speak. That is what keeps you a Christian. That's what keeps you sane. That's what puts you in your right mind when all the world is going to pots. It's what keeps you safe as you journey through the wilderness of this life. Not what you say you believe. Not what you mentally assent to. Not sitting and thinking about Jesus. But keeping Jesus at the centre of everything you do. By being baptised. Prayer repentance, service towards the saints, studying the scriptures, coming to divine worship, receiving Jesus in bread and cup. That's why we bring our children into church to do the same. It's why we baptise them. Because we believe Jesus uses physical things to give spiritual life. The incarnation is the model of the gospel. The gospel is not... Here is a piece of historical information about a historical event. Jesus died on the cross for you. Believe. As true as that is, that is not the gospel. The gospel is not information for you to know and then hope is true. The gospel is not good news for you merely to believe. The gospel is a person who you receive. The gospel is that Christ has come. That God became flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, and the gospel is that he is with you today. That you can experience him today. And you can be filled with his life and his help today. The gospel does not require us to think our way up to heaven. To think our way out of our mess. To meditate uh, uh, in order to escape the wilderness. No. The good news is that we are in the wilderness and in one sense, there's no escaping it, but Christ has come to us here. He's joined us in our mess, in our wilderness, so that whatever is happening in your lives, whatever illness and hardship, whatever pain or uncertainty, Jesus comes to you today in word, in water, in bread and in wine. And he promises you, if you take hold of him, if you walk with him, if you have him at the centre of all that you are, then all of his life and his help is yours today. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.